I'd like to start off by welcoming everyone, uh, no matter where you are. I guess it's good day, good evening. Um, and so thank you for joining us. I'm really excited today. Um, I'd like to first off thank the Aperio Board for extending an invitation to, to join the session to the broader Aperio community. Um, it became clear after we started scheduling these that the expertise and experience of the presenters was something that the entire Aperio community uh, could would appreciate and, and would value. So um, thank you to the board, but also thank you to everyone here uh, for taking the time to join us. I'm very excited uh, by the lineup of the speakers here today. We're joined by Deb Nicholson and Pierre-Yves Gibillo. Uh, both uh, Deb and Pierre-Yves are stepping into relatively new roles, although they have tons of experience, I think, both with the organizations and um, in open source in general, obviously. But um, I think it's a particularly relevant uh, perspective for Aperio as we too consider uh, current drivers and emerging trends, uh, the future direction of, of our organization as we transition ourselves. Um, Deb is gonna start and I'll, I'll introduce both Deb and Pierre-Yves now um, and then we can just uh, transition when, when Deb's finished. Um, and then uh, Pierre-Yves can, Pierre, can uh, pick up from there. Uh, so uh, Deb is currently the executive director of the Python Software Foundation. She has 20 years plus experience working in both nonprofits foundations and supporting free and open source software. Prior to the PSF, Deb served as the interim general manager at the Open Source Initiative, as well as working um, at the Software Freedom Conservancy, uh, the Open Invention Network. I believe I might have first met her when she was working with Open Hatch, which was a very cool project introducing free and open source software development to universities. So college students sort of uh, um, hackathons and, and community development um, practices uh, to promote open source and free software. Um, she is the founding organizer of the Seattle GNU Linux conference. I think they call it Siegel, if I'm not mistaken. We do. It's <laughs> a shameless acronym. <laughs> and uh, um, so, Deb, uh, that's Deb. Let me quickly introduce uh, Pierre Yves uh, as well. Yeah, he's uh, served, uh, I believe, 10 years uh, on the OW2 board. And I think it's been a year now that he was um, asked to join OW2 as their new CEO. Um, he has 25 years experience working in open source as part of both large companies and organizations and small nonprofits and foundations. Uh, most recently, uh, before he joined uh, OW2 as CEO, he was a R and D uh, engineer with Bull. I believe that's now Ethos, um, and he includes experience as a, a professor and researcher at universities, and is uh, recognized as an expert in innovation and entrepreneurship as a cult consultant within the French Public Innovation Agency uh, OSEO. Um, so again, very excited to have them both and their their unique perspective entering organizations, maybe not a new, but it definitely in leadership roles. So with that, I will hand it over to Deb and hopefully you are set up as presenter. Yes, I am. Okay, and thank you so much, Deb and Pierre. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for that warm welcome. Um, so uh, yeah, I did just, uh, it's, now it's been since April that I joined the PSF as their executive director. Um, and so today I kind of want to talk about, uh, from the perspective of being here in like free and open source software for a long time, what I see as sort of the open source of the future. Um, when I, uh, when I first got here, a lot of, uh, open source and free software projects were trying to build nonprofits from scratch without looking at any of the things that nonprofits had done before. Um, and that led to many more hilarious stories than I can tell in 15 minutes. But um, I'll go through some of what, uh, what I have noticed. So um, first of all, I, um, there used to be, like when I would talk to people, there was sort of this allergy to professionalization or anything that sounded professional. And just, you know, like, oh, let's, uh, let's take minutes at our meeting. And they're like, oh, it sounds too, you know, boxing us in, that sort of thing. Um, not real good. 
Uh, or, you know, let's write stuff down. Let's make sure everyone knows what's going on. Let's uh, formalize our onboarding processes. Uh, professionalization is good, and that's what uh, modern open source needs. I just want to say a minute, like, it's not what what we used to mean by professional, so it doesn't mean, like, everyone has to wear uncomfortable shoes and uncomfortable suit jackets. Um, it doesn't mean that we have, like, sort of a um, need-to-know cabal where, like, only two or three people in the organization know what's going on and everybody else is basically uh, being manipulated. Uh, and it doesn't mean like the cutthroat internal competition. So, um, and I think that might have been part of why people were very resistant to professional uh, in open source at first, because they were like, oh no, that's terrible. It has all of the, the dress codes. Um, it also like often uh, sort of meant like these sexist and racist ideas of what professional is, uh, long hours without co compensation or complaint and uh, letting one person, like usually the boss, take credit for everyone's work. And, and that sort of points to a large lack of transparency issue, which uh, is sort of the opposite of what open source means. So I think modern professionalization is a good thing, and I'm gonna talk what I, what I do mean and what I think is uh, sort of the future of open source. So obviously, uh, times have changed, and that means that you know we're really intentional about our goals, uh, to the point where we're so transparent about them, like you can't get us to stop talking about them. Like everyone, someone comes in to like, you know, uh, volunteer at an event and they're just passing out the programs. Like they know what the organization's mission is. Someone does a single patch and in the, you know, they have to click through on the CLA and they're like, wait, what's this org again? And they find out what the organization's mission is. So, um, you know, creating a vision that for where you want to be in a few years and what your mission is, like everyone should know it from top to bottom and it should be absolutely transparent, like to the point where like someone could start to say your mission and everybody else in the room could finish it in chorus. So, uh, you know, that's part of it. I think also um, being clear eyed about uh, your financial picture and matching that with your programmatic goals. Uh, you know, I think that there's this tendency in nonprofits to say like, well, we'll raise as much as we can and then we'll spend it uh, depending on what comes back with our goal of raising as much as we can. Uh, and, um, and that works okay when you're early on and there's not a lot of other, comp you know, nonprofits to compete with and a lot of other places that people could spend their money. But as the open source ecosystem has become you know, like we filled in a lot of like gaps and nooks and crannies. And so people have a lot of places where they could support open source. And th so that means like being really specific and saying to your funders, like, here's what we want to do. Do you want to fund that? Uh, as opposed to like, well, let's just ask everybody for money and then, you know, maybe we'll be able to hire another person if everyone says yes. Um, and it also means planning for success. And, and that means, you know, of course, taking all the proper legal precautions to protect your trademark and file your IRS paperwork on time and correctly. And for an organization the size and age of Aperio, that might mean helping your fiscal sponsorees do that work. Um, but it also means looking ahead and planning for growth and success. You don't want success to be an unplanned for problem that you now have to deal with. You want to have the success be like we got money for the thing that we wanted to get money for and now we can do the thing we've been planning to do. So um, and that one, it's it's sometimes can be hard to uh, get people over that mindset of like, oh, like, can we can we ask for exactly what we want or do we have to pretend that we're saving puppies and then shuttle the money over somewhere else? That's not going to work in the long term, by the way. So. Um, the other thing I would say is you got to think about what it's like inside your organization. So if you're in it for the long haul and everybody is running from project to project with their hair on fire, then um, you're not going to really be able to keep people and you're not going to be able to keep all of your um, organization's history and relationships and all these things. You're going to have to start from scratch every couple of years. So you want to be really careful about what it is like inside your organization so that people feel comfortable there. They feel like they can spend some time there. Um, 
they get enough PTO that they can go and recharge and refresh. Uh, they have enough work-life balance that they're not um, they're not speaking about your mission uh, as if you they haven't spoken to someone in the outside world for five years. Like if you want to grow your mission, it means having some sense of how it's perceived outside of your organization. And that means giving the people inside your organization uh, enough time to recharge and, and be people and not just employees. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, making sure that you're sitting these comprehensive goals uh, and that you're sharing them with your staff people so that you're sort of like, hey, this is, you know, this is what our goals mean and this is what it's going to mean for uh, the number of people who work here and the kinds of work that we're doing so that people can plan around those goals and be optimizing for the right things, um, be building systems. Like if the if the idea is one day we'll have three people that work on this and, um, you know, so the email shouldn't be Ellen at Aperio, it should be admin at Aperio or accounting at Aperio. And it helps people organize their work in a way that fits your goals. And then uh, finally, I would say for internal, you want to make sure that you're really um, intentional about culture. And that, that means like, uh, you know, making sure that everyone feels safe participating. It means codes of conduct, it means um, setting volunteer expectations that respect people's time uh, and their input. Um, you wanna make sure that people feel like they can speak even if not everyone in the room is gonna agree with them. Because if, uh, if they don't feel like they can speak, then there are things you're not gonna find out about. Um, it's really critical to make sure that people can say like, hey, uh, someone said this thing on Twitter. They didn't, it wasn't nice. Um, it wasn't very charitable. It wasn't a call in, it was a call out. But the nugget of it, we have to, we have to hear it. And we, and we have to, we have to see like, is that true? Or are we whatever, you know, whatever Rando on Twitter thought. Um, Cause sometimes that's coming from somewhere even if they're not telling you because they actually want to help. And then uh, the other thing about internal, I would say, is that it means that you're always learning. Um, and that's like particularly with regards to um, making sure that you're building a diverse group of people that are participating in your mission. Because if you're really trying to make things diverse, then you're gonna be constantly learning. You're gonna be finding out about things you didn't know. So you're gonna find out live captioning, it's not cheap. You're gonna find out that uh, many folks in Brazil understand enough Spanish to get by because most folks assume Portuguese and Spanish are close enough, but for most Brazilians, it's still really annoying. And if you're male, you may learn that the short walk from the hotel to the convention center that seemed totally fine to you doesn't feel safe for some of your non-male colleagues. And that next year, you, everyone might wanna stay in the closer but more expensive hotel. And you're, keep lear you're gonna keep learning, it never stops. So. Um, if you want to roll it into your work, then you want to make sure that you create an environment where you can all learn together. So the second piece of sustainability is looking at what it's like outside of your organization. And that can be a little scarier because you don't have so much control on what is outside of your organization. Um, there's, uh, that means contending with like, you know, the landscape as it is like how people perceive open source, how people f perceive academia, which, um, you know, no one organization is in control of, but it means meeting the uh, perception where it is. Um, and so uh, that means, you know, thinking about like how people are using the services or the software that you offer and, um, and not being like, oh, I wish, I wish they were using it more, or I wish they were using it different, or I wish they were finding a different way in. You have to contend with where they're coming from. So for PSF, we have a lot of users that um, don't consider themselves programmers. They use Python as a, a portion of their work to support like their data collection and analysis. Um, and they maybe use it for like 10% of their work, but they use it every day. Um, and we can't control that they don't think of themselves as programmers or don't think of themselves as Python users. They just think of themselves as biologists or scientists or, um, or aerospace engineers. And so, you know, we have to, we have to deal with the world as it is. Um, 
The other thing I would say is that uh, trust is number one when you're thinking about how the um, outside world uh, perceives your project and your mission. Uh, and that means a couple of different things. Um, it means we're on the hook for good documentation of our projects. Like, so if we're putting software out into the world, then people have to be able to figure out how to use it. Um, and they should be able to tell when it's not working the way it's supposed to, and they should know when they need to file a bug and that they can file a bug, right? Um, like what good is it to build something interesting and complicated without docs unless you don't actually want to share it? Uh, I would say we're also on the hook for reasonable security assurances. If people are using your software for anything important, and this is success, this is something you want. You want people to be using your software um, to build amazing, exciting things. So if it's part of their livelihoods, their business, their research work, then your software can't be a huge backdoor for hackers. And of course, we can't see everything, uh, but open source should be shooting for at least as safe to use as proprietary software, if not better. Uh, after all, the many eyes shallow bugs is sort of one of our selling points. So if we've got the eyes, we should make sure that we're making those bugs shallow. And that means that we've got to get the right kind of expert eyes on some of these bugs. And it probably means investing some in your security practices and procedures, which, you know, it's uh, that one's a tough one, because if you thought live captioning was expensive, uh, someone who's a security expert puts that in the rearview mirror. Very expensive. Uh, and then let me see a little bit more about like where we are in the ecosystem, like Open source projects, if you're trying to get something done, then you have other stakeholders that uh, should be involved or could be involved. And so we want to be looking at ways to collaborate together that are good. Um, and looking at, like, uh, you know, are we setting collaboration goals? So for the PSF, like, we have maybe not always had time to do as much collaboration as we would like, but that's one of the things that I've taken on is like, who else should we be talking to about the work we want to do? Because some of that work is work that, um, you know, isn't, uh, isn't something we've traditionally done or isn't part of our expertise, isn't populations that, um, you know, we have represented inside of our office. And so we're looking at like, who should we be collaborating with as opposed to like reinventing the wheel. And that's one of the beautiful things about nonprofit organizations is that we're all trying to make the world a better place and we could do it together. So um, I would say finally, make your open source community delightful um, because we're all in it together. So like really what you're doing is you're making our open source community delightful. Uh, it just, it needs to be a gosh darn delight because uh, when you have a mix of stakeholders, a mix of staff and volunteers, especially when you're trying to change the world, there are folks that like to sit on the light, on the sidelines and say like, oh, you're too naive. That's too hard. Nothing's ever going to change. And you have to be an oasis where hope is not just possible, but it's the norm. And that's what I think is the future of open source. So. Uh, thanks, Patrick, for having me. I'll be here throughout uh, Pierre's uh, talk as well and um, around for questions later. So, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be there in front of you. Uh, sorry for my so European English. I, I will try to do my best. So, concerning OW2, maybe uh, you don't uh, really know OW2. So we are an independent open source community driven organization, which was founded in 2007 and even before, before there was a kind of industrial consortium uh, called uh, Object Web, created uh, as far as I remember in 99. So it's, uh, it's quite old uh, story. And our mission has always been the same, is to promote a code base of open source software a, pro a professional open source software, so uh, we are focused on uh, information systems, and also uh, our goal is to uh, is to animate a community and uh, to to make uh, to make open source successful uh, at uh, at the civil at the level of the civil society. I mean. So concerning uh, the way OW2 is organized, 
The decision making, we have two decision making instances. The most prominent one is the board of directors, which is elected for one year. So we have to organize elections shortly. And then the board elects its president. And the other one is the technology council. It's not so strong in the organization, but uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it's a place where uh, all uh, project managers, anyone with a project hosted at OW2 are invited. The, the instance is led by the CTO and uh, it has in charge uh, the project's life cycle and also uh, eventually uh, technical choices, for example, concerning the infrastructure. So we provide uh, value, what, we, what I call value-added services, but uh, most of that is uh, to say that we are quite a technical foundation. So we have an infrastructure running for our members. And uh, concerning it, uh, we, we host projects. So uh, I should say uh, we somewhat look like uh, Eclipse or, um, or Apache. Uh, we, we are uh, somewhat in between concerning uh, our uh, social and political position. I mean, uh, we, we are less business oriented than Eclipse. I'm sorry for that. So uh, I, I, what I was saying is that we are, we are a quite technical foundation. So we have uh, an open source infrastructure open to our members and projects. So as we host projects, we have a GitLab with a continuous integration. We also have some uh, tools related to software quality or uh, licensing analysis like SonarCube or uh, some tools from Nextbee. We uh, also provide uh, collaboration tools. Some of us, uh, so, some of uh, the tools we provide are our, our own tools. So we, we respect uh, eat uh, your own dog food uh, principle. When we have uh, some an OW2 project that can that can that it can be used on the infrastructure, then we we prefer to use it. Okay. We also we also have an X Cloud, uh, Collabora, uh, and so on, and also a Rocket Chat for for all the community that we use for everyday operations. So concerning OW2, in fact, this slide I. I <laughs> I prepared it for a, a presentation at uh, an organi a European organiza organization, uh, uh, about a, a kind of a cloud uh, community in Europe. So they, they asked me to present OW2 in one slide on five minutes. So that's the reason for it. It's, it's uh, somewhat uh, presented like uh, we are uh, a kind of cloud service. So. Uh, I, I presented OW2 as a community, as a service, but it's uh, it looks like uh, what we are in uh, in real life. In fact, it's uh, it's somewhat true because uh, we have a community of members, uh, the the one you see at the top, okay, with uh, corporate members that can be companies, but also uh, public uh, bodies. For example, we have uh, some significant ones in France. Uh, we have the French Gendarmerie, which is uh, one of our two police forces. They, pro they produce, uh, they contribute to open source projects. So they are involved. We also have the city of Paris, which is quite a prominent one. Uh, we have some uh, foreign ones also in Europe, uh, like for example, Fraunhofer Focus, which is a research center in Germany. So uh, this is our professional community. Of course, there are also big and small companies. One of the most important contributors of OW2 is Orange. So it's a, it's quite a big company. We also have uh, Microsoft and Huawei, for example, but uh, we have a lot uh, of small uh, software providers also from uh, France and from Europe as well, uh, like uh, Seven Bulls in Poland, for example. We also have a quite big uh, service company in Italy called engineering. They are 12,000 people. So it's a, it's a big actor. And we, we, what is also particular to OW2 is, is that we have about uh, 2,600 2, individual members. And individual members don't have to pay anything. They just have to register as individuals. And uh, I, I will tell you more uh, about that later on. So we, that's, that's our community. We also have uh, links with many foundations in Europe and outside of Europe. So uh, as of now, Apereo is not uh, in the list because we did not sign the, 
uh, an, a MOU with you, but uh, probably will do uh, soon. I hope so. Uh, we, we have some uh, European associations, like, for example, uh, Rios in Italy or ESOP in Portugal. CNLL in France also, there are some uh, open source uh, companies, uh, syndicates, generally. So they, they different open source in the professional area. And there are also classical, uh, more general foundations like Eclipse, we, we are used to work with uh, regularly. Or also Open Forum Europe, which is a political uh, lobby, in fact. They are in Brussels and they are very active at pushing open source uh, in the political arena. Uh, we, we, we also are on, on, uh, on advocate on open source and open science advocate. So we are part of uh, a few governance bodies, uh, uh, most of them in France. Uh, we, we are uh, involved in activity in, open, in uh, free software activities of the DINUM, which is the national agency of the French government for IT. We are also involved in the French committee for open science. So we are uh, we are quite active in that uh, in the in the social uh, impact uh, related uh, actions. We also organize uh, or participate to some events to 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 advocate uh, open source, of course. We are also a, a partner of uh, innovation with uh, bo both inside our activities and also uh, participating in uh, in research grants most of them from Europe. So it's a big part of our financing. And uh, I will tell you later about that, but it's uh, even a somewhat too big part of our financing. And of course, what uh, is our DNA uh, is uh, after the community, the code base. So we have some, uh, some, some of our code base are uh, very well known projects. Some can be um, Community projects like uh, the Sympa mailing list, for example, which is uh, very well known and used uh, worldwide. We also have uh, very famous uh, technical libraries like, uh, like for example, uh, ASM, which is a, a bytecode manipulation uh, for Java. And it's, uh, it's one of the most downloaded uh, Java libraries in the world. So it's, a, it's an important one. We also have well known projects like Centreon, for example. So as you can see, we, it's, uh, we, we host uh, prominent projects, in fact. So I, I, I can try a, a little, because you wanted to talk about uh, financing foundations and uh, how it goes in, in everyday operation. So I can try a, a kind of SWOT concerning OW2. I should say that we have a big strength, which is uh, the trust from our community, uh, the technical excellence that is attributed to us, uh, our recognized code base, and the flawless uh, reputation across years. So this is uh, really a green light. But we have a financing problem, a uh, financing issue uh, as of now, is that uh, we, our membership uh, during uh, uh, during the during time decreased because uh, maybe because there are other foundations but uh, it can also be uh, due to our, our operations in in, in fact uh, we were not really good at uh, increasing uh, the membership and uh, it was compensated by uh, eu research grants that finance us so as of today uh, it's about uh, two thirds uh, EU grants and uh, one third community. And this is not, uh, I mean, the, the, our main challenge is to reverse that ratio because uh, the community should be the first uh, financing uh, source. So this is really a, a weakness we have and we, we are trying hard to change it, but it's not easy. It, it will take long probably. Concerning opportunities and threats, what I like very much is uh, there is a very important political shift in Europe towards sovereignty because uh, during uh, recent crises, uh, we, people, po the politicians realized that uh, sovereignty was something important. It's not just a buzzword. So they really turned to uh, digital sovereignty. It's, uh, it's really important now. Uh, digital commons is also uh, on, the, on the table. 
and the open source and open science uh, are becoming uh, central in that uh, in that approach so this is great because uh, we, we need uh, that uh, political support uh, otherwise we, we will never manage I mean it's not possible also what is important is that social economy also becomes central uh, in France the social economy sector uh, as a whole represents about 10% of GDP and 16% of employment as of now. So it's a very important uh, part of our economy and probably it's the same uh, in many European countries. So uh, this is something we have to get closer to, uh, not just concentrate on uh, businesses uh, or, or, uh, or on governmental bodies, but also uh, include social economy in the in the global open source uh, panel so also what is uh, this is quite neutral but uh, it's uh, it's important in terms of ecosystem uh, for for us is that uh, open source becomes mainstream uh, everywhere and people uh, start uh, understanding that uh, they already have open source everywhere in their it so uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is good for uh, gl the global uh, open source market i mean Concerning uh, threats in Europe, we have very big foundations that arrive now or that have arrived soon. So Eclipse moved to Europe. They uh, they try to, to 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 say they are Europeans. Everyone knows they are American, but uh, they they have their uh, I mean they they have settled in Europe and they are uh, officially a European organization. So they are really bigger than us, uh, Eclipse. But uh, no, the Linux Foundation comes. They, they stay in the US, but uh, they just launched uh, the Linux Foundation Europe. So uh, generally, uh, what happens in that case is uh, that the biggest one uh, beco becomes the only one on the market. Uh, and we are afra afraid that Linux Foundation uh, takes over uh, every other foundation. Uh, maybe not OW2 because we are small and not in the radar, but uh, I think we have to move uh, out of the way and to differentiate if we don't want uh, either to be swallowed by uh, one or the other or uh, to just or simply to to starve and disappear. Also, we have a few uh, issues with uh, some uh, EU regulations. I mean, uh, we have a tradition of uh, uh, our regulatory traditions are different, I think, than what they are in the US and the uh, it's somewhat strange. I mean, for example, uh, as of now, we have the Cyber Resilience Act, uh, which uh, which is which is seen as a threat by uh, most actors of uh, open source and uh, also many from the IT sector. In fact, I'm not sure it it can be any any time applicable, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is scared. On the, even in the US, there, have, there has been a very uh, well-informed blog uh, from Mike Milinkovic at Eclipse about that. He has read uh, the whole project and uh, written comments about it. So it's, it's a concern uh, in Europe and beyond Europe. And uh, it, uh, it sometimes happens. We, we have strange uh, uh, regulation customs. So there's something uh, OW2 is trying to obtain currently. In France, we have a status of general interest foundations that is very interesting because uh, it allows uh, donors or members uh, uh, for uh, tax exemptions. About 60% of uh, their donation or, or membership. So it's a very important incentive. Also because it provides a good societal image because uh, we, if, if you do that, uh, I mean, uh, it means uh, you are implied in social economy and uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's also an incentive for companies to say, uh, look, I, I also finance uh, social stuff. So uh, concerning OW2, I don't have any problem with that because uh, I, we can consider we are a kind of digital common. But uh, conditions to obtain it are very, very strict. We have to be so we, we most of them, the, the, the tax services agree that we reach them. But we have some uh, issues because we work with companies. So they say that uh, we uh, provide advantages to companies, which is not really clear. But 
we have to discuss that with them. So I, uh, they refused once. Uh, I could introduce a recourse about that, and uh, they will uh, listen to my arguments uh, next week. So I hope uh, I will pass through this one because if I fail, uh, nothing will change. But uh, if I succeed, it will be an important. Uh, it will be important for us. I mean. So we also provide some uh, because as uh, open source becomes uh, mainstream, we provide some professional uh, tooling and methodologies uh, for OSPOs, for example, uh, uh, in, in the area of governance. Because uh, it's uh, as of now, it's uh, governance has a lot of success in Europe in many events. Uh, everyone talks about uh, open source governance. So we have some technical tools to uh, evaluate uh, professional usability of software. And uh, we use it, this tool, it is online. It works on all our uh, mature projects. And it also will be used by the French state, the DINUM. They just uh, provided us a, a, a small but uh, a, a real grant for that. Uh, I mean, we, we, are, we, are, we will work with them uh, to, to provide them that kind of services. And also, this is included in a more global, uh, in a more global uh, uh, discussion on the, uh, I mean, uh, about uh, about governance. We, we launched a few years ago, maybe two years ago, I think, uh, a governance initiative at OW2, and then uh, it was joined by other uh, foundations, and we founded a common uh, organization called the OSPO Alliance with Eclipse, uh, with Open Forum Europe and uh, the Foundation for Public Code. And we also are the editor of uh, the good governance, the open source good governance handbook. So uh, anyone can, uh, it, it can be downloaded on the site of OSPO Alliance, but uh, you can also purchase it uh, online uh, anywhere, for example, at Amazon, in three languages, as of now, in English, in German and in French. So we also have links with OSPO++, probably uh, Apereo knows know them. I think I, I, I discussed with uh, with Jacob Green recently and uh, I told him I, I would talk to you. So <laughs> he, he, I think he knows you, in fact. So concerning the team, uh, on, because there were some questions about management in the, in the ex emails we exchanged, so I should say uh, my initial proposal on the management side, because I'm, I'm here for less than one year. I arrived in uh, in April 22. So my proposal was uh, to let more, uh, much more autonomy to the team, because uh, I don't want it to do all the work. You, you know, before me, Cedric Thomas, the previous CEO, he was working a lot. It was really his life uh, working for W2. And uh, I didn't want that. And uh, when he proposed me to join, uh, the, my first reaction was, uh, was uh, no, Cedric, I, 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 will, I, I don't want to, to live like that and to work all the time. Uh, you, you need to find someone else. And uh, so when, uh, when I was finally accepted, because uh, it was very difficult to find a, a candidate uh, that fit the, the needs, in fact, uh, I, I finally accepted because I, I could not leave the OW2 on the team alone. Uh, the first thing I, I said is that I, I would give more autonomy to the team and I, I wouldn't make all decisions myself. So we also put the team on stage. I mean, uh, any of them uh, can speak on behalf of OW2. Uh, and uh, this is good because uh, the community reacts very well to that because they, it's not such a big community, I agree, but uh, then they know the people and when they have an issue, a particular issue, they, they can directly contact uh, the sysadmin or the marketing manager or anyone. So th this, is, this is fine and I think they, they like it in the, in the community. So also what I said, because uh, we are facing hard times and I'm not sure that uh, uh, I mean, I have uh, somewhat, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more than one year visibility, but uh, we can fail. I mean, like, like a company, for example, I, I'm not sure that I will still be alive uh, in 2004. So uh, what, what I also said is that we would succeed or fail together. So uh, I, I, won't, uh, I won't fire people or so, if, I mean, if, 
if we fail, we fail. It's, we take the risk. Well, I, I, of course, I also propose myself as the cheapest CEO in uh, EU, and I think I am. <laughs> this is, uh, my salary is uh, somewhat uh, ridiculous. So uh, the question was, what keeps me awake at night? So what keeps me awake at night? Uh, first of all, is the responsibility of six people because they need their job. I, I don't really need mine. I, I, I mean, uh, I had uh, really I had stopped working. Uh, I was 50 and I said uh, it, it's enough. I uh, no, I stop. I disappear and uh, you won't uh, ever hear about me anymore. And uh, OW2 called me uh, one year later and I accepted to work uh, for them because I knew them very well. I liked that association. I had been working in it for years. So, so I finally accepted, but uh, I started as a part-time worker and I'm still, uh, I still have uh, my contract uh, mentioned 60%. Uh, it's uh, rather 80, I think, but uh, I try not to work full-time. So my job is not important, but uh, I don't want uh, people to lose their job because of me. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's really, uh, I'm really frightened of that. And also what, uh, what kept me awake, but uh, now it's getting better, is uh, gaining trust from our members. My, my question was, uh, I, well, I, I, I be really believe that uh, members would not trust me. I mean, I, I just can't believe that uh, they, they renew their confidence to OW2, but that's, what, that's what's happening. So I'm very proud of that. And, uh, and I'm very grateful to the team as well, because uh, I, I could, it's not me. I mean, it's, uh, it's OW2. So what if I were on the Aperio board? In fact, I don't know. I don't know how it works uh, at uh, at uh, at Aperio. But uh, at OW2, we are organized with a very democratic decision uh, process. So we have strategic members. In fact, as of now, we have just one strategic member remaining. It is orange. But uh, we had up to three uh, previously. And uh, strategic members pay uh, much more uh, than uh, other members, than classical members. But the only thing they obtain officially uh, for, their for their money is that they have a seat by right. So they sit at the board. They don't have to go across the election. But their, the bylaw uh, limit their, their power because other members, uh, classical members who, pay, who just uh, register and pay uh, OW2 fees, uh, they, they, have, they also can have a, a set of seats at the board, so they have to go through the election process, but there are as many, at a minimum, there are as many seats for uh, classical than for strategics. So strategics can't have a majority, it's not possible, and moreover, there is one seat for uh, the individual members. So individual members don't pay anything, but they, they have an electoral college and they elect one guy. So there is uh, always, uh, and the bylaws also uh, say that there should be an even number of seats. So uh, this way, we are sure that uh, strategics can't uh, make decisions alone. And also, all our board members are volunteers. We don't pay them anything for that. And uh, that's also, uh, to my opinion, somewhat in, someone, something important. Concerning uh, what we, our communication, I said we participated to some events. Uh, we have a prominent one uh, that we organize ourselves. It's our annual conference at W2Con. So it's uh, get the gathering place of all the W2 community. It's in June this year, June uh, 14 and 15 in Paris. So uh, Paris is a bit far for you, but uh, of course uh, you are welcome to join. Uh, and also the call for paper is open. So you, if you want to apply, uh, you are welcome as well. And I think that's all. And maybe I have been uh, a bit long. Sorry, I don't know if I took more than 20 minutes. But... No, no, okay. Pierre. It, thank you very much. It was great. Um, there's a lot of chatter going on with both you and Deb. So um, I collected a few questions. So while we have time, if it's all right, I'll go through them and, um, in no particular order other than how I copied and pasted them. 
this is really both to both uh, you, Pierre, Eve, and Deb. Um, and I saw Deb, you, you answered a bit um, on the chat, but maybe uh, talk a little bit more here in case folks missed the dialogue on the chat. And the question was um, really about membership and how is OW2 evolving to address the challenges in, of declining membership? I think there's some interest specifically around that. Um, with the uh, Aperio and then Deb's um, while it seems like from the chat you don't have maybe this a similar individual membership or or but I would extend it to include um, corporate uh, membership or, or sponsorship so um, Deb why don't we start with you on um, sort of your membership uh, yeah. activities yeah so we've had an individual membership program for a while but it's never been our focus um, the return on our time is a lot better when we um, talk to corporate entities about funding our work. The Python programming language is uh, pretty integral t for a lot of companies. Uh, you know, like they, they depend on Python being there and the uh, libraries and packages all being available. Uh, but I want to make sure that we're like our, our challenge is to diversify our funding. So we are looking at membership a little bit. Um, but I think more importantly, we're probably going to be looking at uh, grants and some of the other ways that we could uh, do funding, like service-based uh, revenue. Um, as far as the membership, I mean, it's been really hard. Like, uh, I think one of the challenges of just the whole pandemic time frame is that it's especially difficult to meet new people, uh, you know, that are interested in your work. So, like... Um, it's just like for many of the other organizations that I've been at previously where membership was uh, a big part of our budget. One of the big places that we met new people and introduced new people to our work was in person and at events where people weren't like coming to seek us out. They just ran into us and were like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know there was an org that did that. But that kind of serendipity is really hard to replicate online. Sure. Pierre, if you want to uh, touch a bit on your membership activity and, and things you're trying to do to address maybe declining uh, membership or increase individual and corporate membership. Uh, yes, it's not uh, it's not such an easy question. In fact, uh, uh, recently, uh, the, the most uh, promising uh, membership uh, uh, um, membership source uh, we we should have is uh, what we do around uh, OSPOs and governance because it involves uh, some quite big companies and uh, it uh, it makes us visible as well but uh, as i said we are a kind of digital commons and it was not a joke i mean it's it's really what we are i mean that uh, people can uh, somewhat uh, use our services without paying anything and uh, some of that uh, over benefit from that. And uh, this is this is uh, this is really a, a threat. I, I mean, uh, we have to transform uh, contacts into uh, into memberships. And uh, I, I didn't find a, a reliable way to, to do that. Uh, what what is fine is that uh, our members uh, stay f generally. If they don't leave the first year, then they stay almost forever. So many of them uh, are here for. Uh, 10, 12, 15 years. So that's uh, that's great uh, because uh, we, it means we are quite a sound community, but it's difficult to have new people uh, enter, the, enter the group. And uh, I don't really know uh, how, how to fix that. I also count on what we are doing with um, the social economy sector. And uh, recently, uh, we have been uh, solicited by uh, the French uh, political, by, by the French government, in fact, by the DINUM, uh, to uh, to provide a report about uh, about durability of equipments uh, when uh, open source can be installed on them. For example, for smartphones and computers. And so I conducted a study about that, and I had to involve many uh, organizations uh, and people from the social economy. And uh, I was surprised uh, by the, the the way they got involved and contributed to that. So no, just know there is an official answer from the government that yes, 
durability uh, is impacted by open source installability and uh, they, there should this should impact uh, the way we quote equipments i mean we we put a kind of uh, of quotation on equipments uh, to to tell uh, if they are uh, good or bad in terms of durability if you can repair them and so on and uh, this should be part of the of the calculation so it's a, it's a good thing but uh, i think also uh, social we we have to to dig more into uh, social economy into uh, uh, civil uh, organization and uh, everything that makes sense and uh, that makes uh, cohesion between the business area, the public area and the civil society. I don't know how, uh, once again, to transform that into membership, but uh, uh, we have to and I hope also uh, some public bodies will help us because if they don't, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, will, we will starve forever. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that aligns, both of your answers align with what we heard uh, last month with um, sort of engagement. Um, come to mind is the Creative Commons uh, work with the climate change, um, finding both government and, and um, social initiatives that are potential partners. Um, so this is, uh, it's 9.56. We have a ton of questions, but I'm, I want to respect folks' time. Maybe we'll try to sneak in one more quick one and if folks have to drop off, but maybe um, just a, a quick uh, one here. Um, this is regarding collaboration. And I think this is both with your external partners and internally among maybe projects and volunteers. Um, do you establish a description of your workflows and expectations for each other? Um, is this done at the formative stages of the relationships or the projects? And uh, uh, what, when is there a concrete commitment from those folks? So that was a big question, but uh, Deb? Yeah, I think you first have to find alignment. Like uh, it's, uh, if you're certain about what your mission is and what kinds of strategies and activities you're up for participating in and what is just not, on your list of things that you could be associated with you have to you have to get to that part at least um but i think if you can find some alignment on the mission then it's worth uh sharing all of the other things uh that you're doing and how you're doing them and the inputs to that work so if you're like oh well we've been you know uh playing it easy on uh this because we've noticed some skittishness around this topic or we've been leaning really hard into say security because everybody's really excited about that right now so that's sort of the uh like where i would go is but once you have alignment and you know that the orgs the org that you're talking to or the group of orgs that you're talking to uh shares some mission with you then there's no reason not to share all the information that you have that helps you make decisions about the activities that you do Thanks. Uh, Pierre, do you want to add anything about um, setting up and managing collaborative, collaborative relationships, partnerships? It, it, it clearly, what is the question? It is about uh, it is about uh, relationships with uh, with uh, other organizations, for example. Uh, yes. Because uh, we, we really believe in that and we have a large set of uh, what we call associate organizations. The associate organizations are other uh, foundations generally that share uh, our values. And uh, we just signed a reciprocal MOU, which is not really engaging. It, it just says that uh, we, we share values, in fact, and uh, we also share uh, links and uh, try to communicate together. So we, uh, we consider them a kind of members. They don't have rights in the governance, but uh, they are uh, displayed as a specific kind of members uh, on the W2 website. And uh, with some of them, it's just formal, but with, uh, with others, it is uh, really more than that, and uh, some of them, uh, for example, can represent us on events. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, for example, we did that recently uh, at uh, at an Italian event with uh, people from Rios, 
They, uh, we proposed them, uh, we, we could obtain a booth there, but we, it was not really a, a good uh, idea for us. But we, we proposed them to, to go there and to represent a W2. And uh, they, they did that also with uh, some Italian members. So that, that guy, I believe very much. And sometimes we meet uh, these guys also. They come to our events. Uh, we, we discuss or they participate to meetings also at the OSPO Alliance, for example. So I, I think that's important to have a network, uh, to, to be connected with other foundations. Uh, I, I also am trying to start something with OSPO++ uh, and I hope we will have time to discuss a little bit more about that with, uh, with um, Jacob Green on, the, on IPRIO probably because uh, I know OSPO++ is involved uh, in uh, universities, uh, IPRIO as well, and uh, on our side uh, for example, some uh, some actors of OSPO Alliance like Eclipse are more oriented uh, to businesses. So uh, we are at the at the middle of uh, of the of the two uh, of the two, and uh, I think we we have to to work on that. Oh, great! Thank you. Um, so it's ten oh one, and uh, so thank you for. Uh, uh, everyone joining us. I also obviously want to thank uh, Deb and Pierre for taking the time to share a bit about their organizations and uh, some of the work they're doing. Um, I know it's very uh, beneficial for me to sort of hear things and, and uh, recognize similar issues and consider uh, possible suggestions uh, and solutions based on their work. Um, so thank you very much. Um, just uh, the for the folks online, this has become very popular and um, it's been recommended that we extend these and even open the, these events up even more broadly. Uh, so look for an email from Jen or Kathy or Ann Kathy um, regarding future events. We're gonna try to hold them um, second Tuesdays uh, or Wednesdays of the month, every month and invite some more folks from higher ed and open source. So once again, thank you to Deb and Pierre and um, everyone who attended.